Well, hello, Overcoming by Faith family. It is another day that we get to come together and worship God and to be nurtured by the Word of God. I am excited because not only is this Sunday, but it is family weekend, which means it is Youth Sunday. And you are going to be blessed by our youth ministry, our children's ministry throughout this entire service. So, before we get into that, can we pray? Can we just invite God into this service on today? Come on and bow your heads right where you are. Father God, we just thank you for another opportunity to worship your name, God. We thank you for all the amazing things that will be spoken over the lives of your people. God, I pray that that word that is spoken over them, not only do they take that word for themselves, but they share that word with every person that they meet. Father, we thank you and we praise you for the protection and the many things that you're going to do in the lives of your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Once again, I am so thankful that you are here worshiping with us today, and I know that you will be blessed by the service. Enjoy! Every single time, come on and drop in the chat, say, my God, say, my God has a final say. Say, my God has a final say. Y'all ready to dance? Here we go. We serve a good guy. And I will sing my praise unto you, my Lord. And I will dance and shout to you, for you have been my help from now to ever. Can we sing? Hey, 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 my God is good. Hey, my God is good. Hey, my God is good. I love this part. It says, everything now double, double.
to three years old, hosted by your favorite, the one and only, the cutest bear ever, Bo. And if you're 4K to fifth grade, you get the opportunity to learn all about God and explore the Bible on location with Joel and all of your favorite OBF Kids teachers. I really hope you enjoyed that sneak peek into OBF Kids Online. Now all you have to do is join the fun. Every Sunday, you can find us at overcomingbyfaith.org or on the Overcoming by Faith app. Now, Christina, won't you tell us what's new with our AMU? What's up? What's up? Hey, check this out. I wanted you to know the AIM Youth Ministries is starting their very own YouTube page. So now you have the opportunity to get some exclusive um, Bible studies, content, all that cool stuff in regard to the youth ministries. We're going to be posting some 10 minute Bible studies, not only just for you to be able to grow in Christ, but for you to have the opportunity to share those Bible studies with your friends, your family members, everybody. We're going to be sharing some um, eight videos, some small devotionals, and some fun things for you to stay engaged and connected with your youth ministry. So, this is what I need you to do. I need you to go subscribe 
to AIM Youth Ministries on YouTube. Not only subscribe, make sure you hit the notifications button and make sure you let a friend know that AIM is on YouTube. Holla, see you next time. It's time to fall back. That's right. Set your clocks back one hour on November 7th or before you go to sleep the night of November 6th as daylight saving time ends. Ladies of all ages, you are invited to the Ladies Only Escape Conference 2021. This year we'll be escaping with a twist. Main services will be streamed digitally and small group sessions along with creative outdoor events will be held at the beautiful Hilton Head Marriott Resort and Spa. This year's main speaker is Tony Collier. Tony is a communicator, host, and the lead pastor along with her husband, Sam, at Hillsong Atlanta. Our question for you, what would you do if you knew someone was coming to attack you? Come on, let's be honest. We'd either hide out of fear or we would suit up and fight back. Now, by now we know that we have an enemy that's coming to attack us and he is aiming to destroy. So, what are you gonna do? Hide out of fear or suit up and claim the victory that's already been won? As my friend Kurt Thompson says, the enemy is the second strongest force in the world. And your 2000 2021 musical guest is multi award winning independent recording artist Jacqueline Carr. I see miracles. I see miracles. I see miracles happening for you. Don't forget, this year's conference is taking place November 19th and 20th online. All ladies have the opportunity to book a hotel room for safe in-person small gatherings. More information is available at overcomingbyfaith.org on the Ladies Only page. At this time, we would like to acknowledge all first-time guests. Welcome to Overcoming by Faith Ministries online service. All right, OBF family, you know what time it is. Let's welcome all of our brand new guests by sending them different types of emojis to make them feel right at home. If you are a first time guest and would like to learn more information about our ministry, please follow the link provided to you by your streaming host or text the number you see on your screen. We would also like to send you a first time visitor's gift either digitally or in the mail. Also, for all members and friends, if you would like to participate in any of our upcoming small group sessions, text CONNECT to the number on your screen. Thank you for joining us and we pray that you are blessed by today's service. Well, I pray this has all lifted your heart and your mind. I pray you were blessed by it so far. We have a lot going on. This is our Sunday we celebrate young people. As a matter of fact, in our church, we celebrate it all the time. We believe that young people are an important investment. And it's so easy to get sidetracked and not focus on them, especially during this season when there's been so much pain that has happened in our school system. So many kids with COVID, so many kids going through challenges, so many teachers. This has been a tragic, tragic season, but God is faithful. And through it all, we're gonna rise above it. We're gonna rise above it and be stronger, I believe. Learn, be humble. You know, that verse that says, if my people that are called by my name would humble themselves. Sometimes we've been a little bit arrogant. Maybe we should be a little more humble, help each other, work together, fight together, help the schools, help the teachers, help everybody, help the young people, not judge, put our arms around each other, both, both whether you're Democrat, Republican, independent, whatever you are, black, white, small, tall, short, heavy, light, doesn't matter, we need each other. And church should be a place that brings people together. And so let me pray for you today, and then we're gonna receive our offering. And so. We're going to believe that God's going to help us in this season. Father, bless our country. Help us during this difficult season. I pray for our young people who are going through tremendous loss and challenge. I pray, God, that you would heal and bring grace and wisdom and unity to our nation. And I pray we'd fight together and not each other. It's only when we fight together 
no matter where we come from, that we will win together. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank you for being with me. I want to thank you for your support. I want to thank you for all that you do. Our members are incredible, incredible, incredible. Our church has been digital for many, many years. We started streaming in 2007. So quite a few of you are used to being home and streaming in and getting in small groups. And we're going to expand all of that good stuff. We have a whole lot of expansions and ideas uh, bringing a new level of grace to our technology and to our small group gatherings, which is a big part of our dream for the future in the coming year. So I want you to uh, continue to pray for us and continue to join us in our groups. If you go to our website, you can see all the different options we have. We also have the app, Overcoming by Faith Ministries app, which I'll mention again in a minute, that you can download and it has all kinds of great stuff on there. So let me pray for the offering first and then pray. I want to pray for you. Many of you are going through financial seasons right now. So let me pray for you. Father, I pray for those who are watching today. I pray that you would, your hand would be up on them financially. Money really makes a difference for a lot of people. It is the bondage for some. Heal their finances, give them advantage, give them an abundance above what they need. I pray they would feel your presence in their lives. The entrepreneurs who are starting new businesses, these people that are beginning, Lord God, to branch out, <clears throat> excuse me, in their lives and careers, I pray your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Now I want to pray for the offering. Father, I also pray for this offering that what we receive today would be a blessing, not only, Lord God, to those locally, but those that are we, we touching beyond the local walls of this church. And I thank you for the resources. I thank you for the opportunity to give and to have resources to make a difference in the world and not just talk about things we don't like in the world. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for giving today. Let me give you a couple of instructions if you want to know how to do it here. We have a couple of options, and this is for people who are new. Many of you, you've never given before and you'd like to join us. Here's how you do it. Number one, you go to the website, overcomebyfaith.org uh, uh, is a website you can go to. And on that website, you have a give option. You also have other options to see all the different things we offer, programs, small groups, and all the things you might want to check out. So feel free to do that. You can also give by text if you like. You can simply text in your uh, offering uh, and you set it up one time and you have it and you can text your gift that way. Thirdly, you can send it to your own bank through the bill pay system on your bank, which is a cool way to do it. A lot of people do it that way. And you simply, again, there's the address, put it into the bill pay one time and you can send your offering on a routine basis if you desire. And lastly, I always mention this because the app is just the coolest thing in the world because the app can be right there in your hand. It has all the kids programs, which also is true on the website, but you have kids programs there. Your kids can watch the programs anytime they want to. We, are, we do two new kids programs every single week. Yes, we do. And we are committed to making sure that your family has the tools it needs to reach out to your kids. One of the tragedies of the season is kids have been forgotten about. So I, I want to encourage you to use that. It's OVF Kids, a great program. They do, like I said, two brand new uh, uh, edit, put together programs, every single digital program every week. And it's for your children. And you also have that give option right there on that, on that app, Overcoming by Faith Ministries app, downloaded, thousands have done it. Please do that and we'd love to see you join our app family. Well, we're about to take another step. I'm gonna to turn to some Q&A questions in a minute. People ask me questions about this and you don't wanna miss it. It's an amazing, amazing opportunity to have a dialogue. I love Q&A. And so I have a list of questions that people have asked me about how to make decisions and we'll talk about that. And then we'll tell you more later on about our next week, first Sunday, uh, gathering, which is every first Sunday at 11 o'clock, we have a live gathering here at Overcome by Faith on our property at 9700 Middle Ground Road. And we'll tell you more about that too in just a little bit. But first, we got the sermon coming. So enjoy this next special gift we have for you, then the sermon, and then we'll tell you some more things that's coming. It's going to be great. Stay right there.
Welcome back, glad you're with us. We are going to take a step today to answer some of your questions about decision-making. Decision-making is one of the most important things that you can do in life. It determines where you're gonna go. Making decisions that are smart and that are practical can really change everything in your life. I've listed some questions that I think people often ask me about decision-making, but I wanna make sure that we are on the same page and again, I want to thank you for being with us. I want to thank you for your patience and grace with us as you study the word with us. It's really just good stuff. It really is practical and helpful. I want to remind you of a book that I introduced you to. Uh, it's called Farsighted, and I keep getting it wrong when I say it, but it's Farsighted, not Foresighted. It's Farsighted. And in this book, uh, there are three basic principles that he lays out that I kind of borrowed from, and I want to give him credit. One is he talked about three phases of making a good decision. One is you have to have what he calls the mapping phase. This is where you lay out the truth and you say, this is the truth about where I am. It's kind of like when you're trying to find your way around a mall, right? You have to know where you are first before you can get to the destination you want to get to. And so normally on those signs in the mall, they'll say you're here. And so mapping is about being honest about where you are financially, emotionally, mentally, wherever you are. It's hard for people sometimes to do that. It's hard for them to say, you know, ah, I'm not where I need to be. I'm not really as disciplined or as committed, and I need to maybe work on that. So the mapping phase is crucial. We talked a lot about that this month, then in this series, rather. Then secondly, uh, we talked about the next phase, which is the prediction phase. The prediction phase is based on the map. What do you predict will be true? If you are trying to uh, graduate from college, say, for example, and that's what's on your map. I want to graduate with a bachelor's degree in architecture or engineering. And you write that on the map. But you look at your study habits. You're studying an hour a day. I predict you won't finish. That's the predicting phase. And that's what's really important um, about the mapping phase. Because if you're not honest on the map, your predictions will be wrong. You can't possibly have a good marriage the way you're acting. You can't possibly get married with your thinking process. You think too much like a single person. You don't, you don't want to open your heart to inviting anybody else in. And so the mapping phase, he, said, he talks about, then the predicting phase, and then the last one is the decision phase. So if you look at the map, and the map is saying, okay, I want to be a college graduate in four years, and that means I'm going to have to study at least four hours. So I predict that if I study four hours, I'll be fine. But let's look at the map and say, well, I want to, be a, I want to graduate in four years, but I'm studying an hour a day. That's not going to work. So I have to make a new decision. So I map, I predict, and I decide. The decisions I come up with are tied to where I want to be on the map. Just a great concept. I thought it'd be great just to use. And a lot of times in church for people, the problem is the mapping phase. They're not honest. And so there are a lot of questions people ask me about, about those things. And so I want to go over them with you a little bit and kind of talk you through some of the questions that people ask me. And I want to start with a verse. It's in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. And this verse kind of talks about the importance of questions and responding to questions. Here's what Peter said. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have. I want you to be able to give an answer so there's nothing wrong with people asking a question. In the book, um, You Lost Me, one of the things by Kinnerman, David Kinnerman wrote a great book you ought to get called You Lost Me. He says, one of the problems with, with Christians is that, and one of the reasons that young people don't like us is because we don't like to be questioned. We don't like science. We don't like anything that's an, and that, that, that analyzes what we say. And sometimes when preachers talk, they think, well, once I say it from the pulpit, it's the gospel and it's the word and no one can ask a question. Jesus allowed questions. So your questions are valuable. And I, I, I love Peter's comments. He says, you know, be able to give an answer for the reason for the hope that's within you. But do this with, when you do it, do it with gentleness and respect. Be kind, be gracious. Don't be arrogant and condescending. And sometimes when you're full of religious zeal, if you're not careful, you'll come off as a real, pretty arrogant person. Let me start with question number one. Here's a question. How do you make a good decision? That's the first question I'm asked a lot because people are so afraid of making wrong decisions. Well, let me just say, making wrong decisions is part of making good decisions. You're going to make wrong decisions. I don't care how hard you try. I don't care how hard you work. 
I don't care how much you do. You're going to make some decisions that aren't perfect. But what you do is start off with those three things I mentioned in the beginning. Map. Map out the truth. Lay the truth on a piece of paper. Say, here's the truth. Here's the truth. My finances are here. My marriage is here. Just lay out the truth. And then predict where you're going to be. And if I don't change, and then make new decisions to help you get to where you want to be. And so you make good decisions by admitting that you're going to make wrong decisions, but then starting with that, that little simple guide I gave you and map out a different beginning. And I've done that in my life. I'm in the middle of it now. There's some decisions I've made lately that are tied to some things I specifically want to see changed in my life. So that's the first thing I'd say. How do you make good decisions? Get your map out. Get honest. Be honest about your predictions. And then, of course, make new decisions. Number three. Number two, rather. Name one. This is a great one. <laughs> Of the worst decisions you made in your life. Wow. The worst decisions I have made in my life. Man. Wow. You ready? I don't know. These are honest. These are like really honest answers uh, about my journey with decisions. Number one, dating decisions. I call them the three Ds. Three Ds. Dating, debt, and delay. There you go. Those are three. I know you asked for one, but let me give you three. I, I call it the three Ds. I, I um, at times, especially in my earlier years when I first came to Christ, you know, you date because they're cute. You date because you're available. You date for reasons. And I'm not putting anybody down that I ever dated. I'm just saying it just, sometimes the reasoning behind it was not very well thought out. It was just, you know, I like you. You, you make me feel good inside. I get a buzz when you walk by. But you're, some, some people, the biggest decision they can make that can be the biggest mistake is a dating decision, who they allow themselves to fall in love with. And then in this culture, with that comes a whole bunch of other benefits. You know, you're, so you're sexually active with everybody you date. You're, you're, you're hanging out. You're living with everybody you date. Eventually, you're sharing, you're buying property together. Before you know it, your life is all commingled in ways that um, can become a bad decision. So for some people, dating uh, is the issue. And I think in my case, I'd say, again, one of my Ds, the three Ds, one is dating. Uh, second one would be debt, uh, tolerating debt, tolerating owing people, tolerating payments when I didn't have to. There were things I could have just waited to get or things I just thought, you know, yeah, I'll go ahead and do it because I can. And I think there are times, I remember one time I bought a vacuum cleaner. And I bought this vacuum cleaner, and I didn't have to buy it. It was I, the guy asked me a question. He said, "Can you afford thirty-nine dollars a month?" Of course I can. I, I responded. You know, it's a terrible decision. And the thing ended up costing me seven hundred dollars. Don't tell anybody I told you that. But there are moments you just—I <laughs> won't say the name of the company. And then the thing died before I finished paying for it. Can you believe it? And they wouldn't fix it. So I just remember I should have just went down to Walmart and bought myself a vacuum cleaner and, and picked up the dirt or got a broom. Bad decision, and and allowing yourself to make payments on things that you should just pay cash for and be free from. Uh, but that was one. And, and a, lot of times, a lot of times, believe it or not, when you make more money, you can be vulnerable to do things you shouldn't. And young people, I want you to think about this. Because a lot of you right now, you're in college, and you're you're just racking up debt unnecessarily. Some of you, you're not using your student loan money wisely. Uh, you're partying and having a good time. It could be a bad decision long term. So that was one. So. Let's see, dating, debt, and then delay would be the third one. One of my three Ds, bad decision. Um, my worst decision, putting things off that you should start today, things you should do now, uh, waiting too long to begin doing things that are really important. And you look around your house and you say, oh, boy, there's a lot of delay around here. Yeah, stuff everywhere. And you, it, you have this delay temptation. And that, that can become the greatest mistake you make. Some of you should have gone right back to school, get right back into your job, go right back to work, uh, fix those issues. And what I try to do is I try to have a things to do list of things that I need to do on a daily basis that, that, are, that help me get to certain goals I have. And I try to keep it small. So I have like three things or four things that are really, really important. I made, I, I'm big on having the to-do list. Uh, and the to-do list is, is, is small, uh, and it's, I'm going to do it today. It's no delays because I have seen some of you, your garage is one big delay, right? Mm -hmm. Your car, your uh, your health, uh, and you keep putting it off. So 
Those are my, my, the three Ds were my biggest mistake. That's my biggest mistake ever, allowing that to happen. Here you go, number three. Uh, name one of the best decisions you made in your life. <laughs> I put that under what I call the three L's, the three L's as in long, the three L's. Here you go, number one. Listening was always a great thing I did. I've been a good listener. I've always um, loved to read, uh, especially in the last, oh, let me see. I started really reading at about 16, but I really got into reading at about 19. College was when I really started having to read a lot because of college. But listening to truth, listening over and over again, that really um, helped me. Listening was my biggest, smartest thing. Second smart thing was under the, my, my three L's would be uh, learning. I, I, I really learned a lot. I, I, there, there are things that I came to understand from listening. Certain lessons I can cite for you, things people said to me. Like, for example, one guy said to me, if you talk too much, smart people will stop talking around you and you will, you will then be in big trouble in life because you won't have their influence. And I remember that. So when smart people are talking, I try to listen. I'm, I'm a big listen, then learn, and then here's the third thing, lead, leading. Leading was a big, leading was a smart thing for me. This was my calling, my assignment in life, and finding that is really great. So the smartest thing, best decision I ever made was accepting the job as a pastor, accepting the leadership role. Um, it's a humbling opportunity, um, listening, learning, leading, those three things. So I put them in threes, um, the worst decision, best decision that I've made in my life. But listening, if you want one, listening would be the best thing. Listening, just making sure that I listen properly. Number four, fourth question, how do you survive making a bad decision? I've made some. I've made some, and, and I didn't mean to make them. And that's why I believe that part of making good decisions is making bad decisions, that you're going to make some decisions that aren't perfect. And you have to learn how to live through that. There's a book by John Maxwell called Failing forward. That is such a good book. It is just fabulous. You have to learn how to embrace the process of not being perfect. And, it, and it, he walks through this whole thing in that book that really can help you, some of you that struggle with failing. You want to succeed, but you got to be okay with not being perfect. Uh, in um, the latter seasons of my life, I only like A's, only like hundreds in my academic pursuits. But I've learned that I can't always get a hundred. But I'm close. I'm trying. I'm always. I'm always going after it. Um, but I. I think that when you make a bad decision, here's what you do. You ready? Number one, admit it. I made a bad decision. That that wasn't a good decision. And then number two, you ready? It's important. Stop it. <laughs> Once you admit it, don't continue doing it. Stop it. And then here's the third thing. You ready? Grow from it. Okay. Admit it. Stop it. Grow from that. You have to grow. This is a growth moment. I, I often say, you put it in the library of wisdom and you will never be the same. Because now you know about marriage, about your life, about whatever you, mistakes you've made. You put that, raising children, whatever it is, admit it, stop it, and grow from it. Okay, here we go. Number five, how do you stop others from making bad decisions? Now, this is tricky because if you're not careful, you will assume too much. I love the book by called Boundaries by Townsend, by McLeod and, and, and Townsend, where they talk about the fact that you are not responsible for somebody else's outcome. So here's what you do when you, you advise people. Number one, you ready? When you, when you, if somebody's going to make a bad decision and you see it, the question is, how, what do you do? You advise them. If they allow you, you advise them. You open your heart and you tell them the truth. But once you've done that, in the book called Boundaries, he says, basically, that's all you can do. I'm not responsible for their outcome. What they sow is what they reap. And I need to be okay with the fact that maybe this is one of those moments all I can do is, number two, you ready? Pray for you. So what do you do? How do you help somebody that's making a bad decision? You advise them. Number two, pray for them. Yeah, you pray. Lord, help them. Lord, help them see. Sometimes with your kids, that's all you can do. Pray for them. You don't have any other, other tools. And then lastly, uh, <laughs> wait and see. <laughs> so you advise them, pray for them, and then you wait and see. Let's see how that went. Did they connect with that truth? 
And sometimes you see them living in cycles of challenge and you can't, you know, you can't, you can't fix it. You can't correct it. You can't get them to, you just have to wait and see what's going to happen. And that can be hard. All right, next question. Let's see. Number six. Uh, is it your responsibility to save people from bad decisions? Well, sometimes yes. Sometimes no. Sometimes you, you, I see people about to make a decision and I step in and I'll say something. And that's the right thing to do. But sometimes I don't have that opportunity and sometimes I don't even know they're making it. The big thing here is this, this tendency to feel responsible. In this question and the last one, no, last question was how do you stop people from making bad decisions? This one, is, 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 is it your responsibility to save people? And that, that too can kind of mix together in your soul where you're always feeling responsible for somebody's bad choices, especially parents. Listen, you can't be. I know it hurts, but that, that's not your decision. And once kids and people get to a certain age or employees, you know, sometimes you see people lose their job. I mean, that's, that's something I control. You know, if you work for me, you have a job to do. And if you can't do the job, you can't keep working for me. And that's, that may not be easy to say or to know, but yeah, yeah, I have to do my job. You have to do your job. You get paid, I get paid. Everybody has to, you know. And so as a boss, you have to kind of understand <clears throat> sometimes the best decision for people uh, is not the decision they make. And you're not responsible for that. Number seven. What if you mapped, predicted, and decided, and you still made the wrong decision? So what if you said, Pastor Rick, all right, I sat down and I wrote out a map. I sat down, I predicted this outcome, and then in the end, I made a decision and it was still wrong. Well, try it again. I, see, there's no perfect formula for making all perfect decisions because Sometimes the only way you can learn to make the right decision is make the wrong one. And you can't worry about that. You just can't dwell on that. <clears throat> I, I wish I had made all the right decisions. I have not. I have tried. But I didn't make all the perfect decisions. I, and I talk about them openly. I'll say, you know, we were going to build a building that was going to drown us. I thought we were doing the right thing. I, you know, I did all my homework. I went to all the right advisors. But it was too much to build. Too much. So we bought land. And we built, we built, we designed our ministry differently. We expanded digitally, which was incredibly smart. Around the time that we were going to build this huge building, we ended up having to um, change our plans because we, it's funny, we were working on this in 2007. There was a, <laughs> there was a major, the God knew was coming. It was a major economic downturn coming in 2008. For us to be in a building program in 2008 would have been disastrous. So what we did was we invested in buying land, which was really smart. We bought a, all the land around us. Then we turned around and invested in some other, other properties. And we also invested a lot of money in digital expansion. We went online. We started streaming in 2007. We started investing in uh, digital gatherings. It was amazing. And it was the best decision we could have made. So eventually we made go by, build something else down the road when it makes sense. But my point is our ministry moved to a digital platform. We started doing things. So sometimes in life, you, you try your best to make the right decision. You map it out. But one thing that's really interesting, there is a story um, that I heard about that was so powerful about how years ago in New York, there was this, this pond that they, um, uh, it was a big, beautiful area, uh, body of water, and they decided what they would do is fill it in, right? And so they filled it in, and they put housing on top of it, and they didn't know that this housing over the next 100 years or so would sink, and it did. And so the housing project began to, <laughs> the housing began to sink. And so the question was asked, was uh, the author said, well, did they know that it was going to sink. No, because there was nobody at the table when they first made this decision 100 years ago that would have even known that this potential would happen because they didn't have the technology, they didn't understand soil, they didn't understand, they didn't understand sediments, they didn't understand a lot of that. 
the geology wasn't at the level where they would be able to understand it. So they made a decision based on their current level of knowledge. And for some of you, that's the truth. You made decisions based on your current level of knowledge. And so that's why you married that kind of person, because that's all you knew. But now you've grown. That's why you ended up in that career, because you didn't understand yourself. You thought you knew. So my point is that in time you grow and you make better decisions. So you can map everything out. You can predict. You can make decisions and still not be in a perfect situation. But if you keep going, you'll get there. So they learned. They learned, okay, that was a bad decision, and they made a better decision. So take that up and put that in your heart. Now, let me give you a couple of bonus questions that people ask, and we're going to be done for the day. Here you go. Question is this. What if you don't have the right mapping tools to make a decision. Okay, so you said, Pastor Rick, I obviously uh, have been trying to get the right decisions made, but I don't know. I keep getting it wrong. Here's what the Bible promises, Matthew 5 and 6. I live by this verse. Here's what it says. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They shall be filled. Here's what I believe. If I keep going in the right direction with the right attitude and the right spirit, I'll be filled. I'll get there. I will get there, I'll be there, and it will all be okay. I, I quote that sometimes when I'm not sure what I'm doing. Father, you said that you'll help me get there. You said if I hunger for what's right, what's righteous, you'll fill me. I trust you. And I want you to pray that prayer. In this season, with all that we're dealing with, that's about what we have to say. I don't know which way to turn, God. I don't know all the right answers. But you said if I hunger and thirst for your input, you'll give me the right path. And I believe in time, I've seen God do that in my life. Last question, bonus question. Uh, what kind of, and this is a, a, a kind of um, at the root of this whole series on decision-making that kind of sparked me to think about this? Because I, I think we've made some, as Christians, we've made some theological, spiritual, religious decisions that concern me. Here's the question. Um, and and this, this will be, the last one. Here we go. If I can get to the right page. Here we go. All right. Uh, what kind of theological decisions have we made today that could be dangerous for our Christian testimony in the future? What kind of theological decisions have we made today that could be dangerous for our, for our Christian testimony in the future? I, I, Christians make decisions that sometimes, are, and not just Christians, but people in certain generations make decisions that they don't understand the long-term implications of. They, they don't see it. I think those who uh, founded slavery, for example, didn't see the long-term implications of what that would mean. Certain wars we got into, we couldn't see when we got into the Vietnam War, when we got into Iraq, when we got into Afghanistan, various places we got into. We did not see a, a, the longest war, 20 years. We didn't see the, the war in Afghanistan. We didn't see a lot of things. We did not, we saw out a little ways. And there are people who kind of guessed, predicted, you know, they, they said, okay, this is going to be the outcome. And some were right and some were wrong. But one thing is true. There are certain things that we can decide to do. Certain, and I use the term theological on purpose, religious decisions and bathe them in verses and tie verses together and get up and preach on topics and tell everybody what they should do. And, and we think we're right. But the long-term damage can be really profound. Now, I want to say the question again and give you my quick answer. What kind of theological decisions have we made today that could be dangerous for our Christian testimony in the future? Here's the answer. Many of us have decided, I'm going to put this on the screen so you can see it. Many of us have decided to pick sides and define truth too narrowly. So now, if we're not careful as believers, we have defined truth very narrowly. Baptist people think it's all the Baptist way. Pentecostal is all the Pentecostal way. Everybody got their own definition, you know, and it's real narrow. There's no room for anybody else. Catholics, real, Protestants, everybody's got their own way, their own way of seeing things. And that's true around the world, and that's really dangerous. Now, I love this truth. Jesus came to save the entire world, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. Just stop right there, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, that includes, watch this, black, white, Republican, Democrat, independent, local and international. Jesus came for everybody. He didn't just come for people who think like you, who look like you, who 
think the way you think and process the way you process. And for that reason, here's what we must do. Broaden our love and concerns to include everyone. We got to decide that we can't survive fighting each other. We've got to decide that one of the worst things we could ever do is be divided. And I want to say that's going to take us to our next series. Because I believe in life there are some things that work and there are some things that don't work. Division does not work. And that's my next study. Division does not work. Unity does. And so I want to take a few weeks and talk to you about that. I want to talk to you about division and why it doesn't work. And I want to talk to you about what does work. Deciding to focus on what works can change everything. Our young people are, are looking at us and they're saying, come on, people. We need you to be an example of unity, of togetherness, not division. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this time. I pray what I've said in these last few minutes has been helpful. I pray that it's lifted their minds and hearts to consider a new way of looking at the world. I know that we sometimes who come to a religious conviction feel so strongly about it. and We can hardly hear anybody else. Help us, Lord, to open our hearts and minds to see and hear another, another way. I give you all the praise and I give you all the glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to pray one final prayer for some of you who say, Pastor, you know, I'm one of those people who I need God in my life, but I did believe that most religious people I'm dealing with see the world too narrowly. Listen, I don't know where you are. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what your status is, but I know God loves you. For God so loved the world that if he gave his only begotten son so that you may come to know him. So let me pray for you. Father, I pray for that person watching today who needs a touch of God in their life. They don't know what to do. They don't understand the Bible. They don't understand us, but they want you. So I pray that you would touch them in a way that only you can. And may this be the beginning of a new life for them. In Jesus' name, amen. I say this every week, and I want to encourage you to hear me. If you, are, if you prayed that prayer with me, man, I'm telling you, I'm happy for you. And I want to see you just, just give me a chance to send you something to help you start your walk on the screen if you're watching during a session where we have a live live presence it says on your screen there it says hey uh, raise your hand which simply means if you push that button or if you type in the chat I raise my hand they'll send something to you to help you start your walk with Christ I want to encourage you to do that and if you'd like to reach out to me personally you can at pastor at overcomingbyfaith.org that's pastor at overcomingbyfaith.org I'd be glad to send you some information personally to help you start your walk with Christ and invite you to a gathering we'll have where we talk to people about how they grow in their walk with Christ. So thank you for being with me today. Thank you for being here. I thank you for allowing me to talk to you. I want to call you every first Sunday. We have a gathering, and next week is that first Sunday gathering right here on our property, 9700 Middle Ground Road. It's a drive-in service. It's real safe. Sit in your car. We've got music, live music, and we've got um, uh, you can sit in your car and turn on your radio station and listen to the whole service. And then we're going to have some concerts out here down the road. We got some things coming down the road. It's going to be great. Small group gatherings. See that on your app and on the website. It tells you when we're going to have small group gatherings. You can be a part of every single uh, day. We're online somewhere. You can find us. But if you got a question, a prayer request, feel free to email me at pastor at overcomingbyfaith.org. It's a joy to be with you. We've got a lot to talk about next time. We're going to talk about what works next time and what doesn't work. We'll start off with what doesn't work. And I'll show you what, folks, it, it, it will change your life, lift your vision, and help you get on the track of what does work. A lot to talk about. See you next week. Have a great day. Thank you for being with us. God bless you. Hopefully you get to come out. Now, remember, first Sunday is going to be on the property, 9700 Middle Ground Road, 11 a.m. sharp. We don't start late. The 9 o'clock digital service will be the same. You don't have to miss that. And that will be a different sermon than the 11 o'clock sermon that's live here on the property. So I get to see you. God bless you. We got something for kids, too. All that good stuff's going to happen right here next Sunday at 11 a.m. God bless. Bye-bye. You can find today's message later today at overcomingbyfaith.org. Select Watch On Demand, the Overcoming By Faith app. Also, find a link of the message on all OBS social media platforms. It's time to fall back. That's right. Set your clocks back one hour on November 7th or before you go to sleep the night of November 6th as daylight saving time ends. 
Ladies of all ages, you are invited to the Ladies Only Escape Conference 2021. This year, we'll be escaping with a twist. Main services will be streamed digitally, and small group sessions along with creative outdoor events will be held at the beautiful Hilton Head Marriott Resort and Spa. This year's main speaker is Tony Collier. Tony is a communicator, host, and the lead pastor along with her husband, Sam, at Hillsong Atlanta. Our question for you, what would you do if you knew someone was coming to attack you? Come on, let's be honest. We'd either hide out of fear or we would suit up and fight back. Now, by now we know that we have an enemy that's coming to attack us and he is aiming to destroy. So, what are you gonna do? Hide out of fear or suit up and claim the victory that's already been won? As my friend Kurt Thompson says, the enemy is the second strongest force in the world. And your 2000 2021 musical guest is multi-award winning independent recording artist, Ja'Kalen Carr. Don't forget, this year's conference is taking place November 19th and 20th online. All ladies have the opportunity to book a hotel room for safe in-person small gatherings. More information is available at overcomingbyfaith.org on the Ladies Only page.